so essentially what I want to talk about is explaining why jihadism uh, grew so rapidly in Tunisia after the uprisings. You know, when you, when you hear about Tunisia, most people will first think about how it's, you know, this relatively cosmopolitan country, how many of the people there are very secular, um, and the fact that they have these individuals in the jihadist movement um, might be surprising to many. Um, maybe less so now, just because you've heard so many news stories about Tunisians being in Syria. Um, but when I first happened across this topic in uh, May 2011, I was a little bit surprised myself, um, just because historically, when you thought about this type of movement, you thought about maybe Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Egypt, Syria, um, and other places, but not really Tunisia, since they didn't have much of a history of it. Um, but then, one morning when I was um, scrolling through some of the forums online that I usually do, I saw this notice for this um, uh, this f this f this one conference that was going to happen in Tunis in the middle of May. And this is in 2011 for this new organization called Ansar al Sharia, and I was like, "Whoa, this is pretty weird. I need to look into this more." Um, and I was just curious to hear more about it, and sort of uh, took me down this whole rabbit hole where I wanted to get to really understand it and. Uh, under and see what happened. So um, now I'm about to hopefully, well, I'm not about to finish it, but I've got about another year, year and a half to complete my dissertation. Um, so this is sort of the basics of what is in it essentially. Um, and a lot of it's related to history too. Um, you can't really explain what happened after 2011 without understanding a lot of the processes and conditions that were happening in Tunisia as well as within the broader um, jihadist movement. So essentially what I wanted to do when I started this was come up with a question. The basic one is why did jihadism explode so much after um, the revolution? But then I, I uh, came up with some other subsidiary questions that I hope to help better probe this topic. And uh, one of them was what are the conditions that led to its rise? Um, how was you know, Ansar al-Sharia able to implement um, its experience and plans, um, and I'll get a little bit into this more in terms of the fact that there was experienced individuals involved in the creation of this organization, um, and also why have so many Tunisians become involved in this foreign fighter type of phenomenon, whether it's in Syria, but now you also have seen many uh, Tunisians been involved in the fighting in Libya, um, and they've also been, in, they are also involved in some some action in Mali a few years ago as well. Um, so while much of, much of what I write about is pretty much a history, um, I wanted to still sort of buttress this in some, my, the empirical research and some theory. So um, a, lo a lot of, I used, I basically used um, aspects of social movement theory uh, since I've had experience with that and as an undergrad I did political science so I thought it'd be the one that would make most sense to me. Um, so essentially, there are, there are three main subcomponents of this: you know, political opportunity structures, resource mobilization, um, and framing, um, which essentially you could say is the conditions. Um, you know, how was AST able to implement its program, um, and then how are they able to proselytize these types of ideas? Um, so before getting into specifically, I think it's important to go back um, prior to 2011. Um, you know, Tunisia is a very unique country in that um, it's, it's one of the few Arab states, or the only Arab state, that really changed the game in terms of Islam. Um, Bourguiba essentially wanted to create his own interpretation of Islam, a republican Islam, as he liked to call it. Um, whereas other states, they didn't necessarily have these types of reforms. Um, it was, and, and because of this, he created a lot of legal changes as well as educational, cultural changes. And some of this directly contradicted orthodox understandings of Islam. I mean, for example, there's the famous case of him drinking orange juice on TV during Ramadan um, and talking about how, you know, you don't necessarily need to be involved in fasting because what's really important is economic activity and the development of the country. Um, so he really was creating his own interpretations, but because of this and the fact that he sidelined um, the religious establishment, um, you had, while definitely some became co-opted within the system, there were definitely an underground group of people that were upset 
um, especially those that had grown up with a religious education and felt that, you know, what was happening was even though France wasn't, uh, you know, in charge of the state affairs, they're indirectly culturally changing the tenor of society. So then you started having the creation of different study groups or halakas as they call them, um, where they would just be um, teaching each other independently underground, you know, religious ideas, philosophies. It wasn't yet a political movement. It wasn't yet talking about economics. We really didn't start seeing this until um, the late 1970s and early to mid 1980s um, as the economic situation got worse as well as um, some of the bread riots um, and some of the activities of the unionists in Tunisia at the time. Um, eventually you started to see a col uh, collection of different, you know, of these different religious groups coming together under the banner of uh, Jamaat al-Islamiyah in the mid-70s. Um, and then over time they changed the name of these groupings um, and eventually came up with the name of the organization or party or group or movement, however you want to describe it now, um, is Hizbah Nahda. Um, and they essentially became the mainstream Islamist group inside of Tunisia for years. Um, and they still are the largest Islamist group. Um, but over the last 20 to 25 years, sort of the percentage of people necessarily following them has gotten a, a little bit smaller. They have smaller market share, I guess, if you're using um, business parlance. Um, and, and essentially what happened is that because they gained more popularity over time, because people sort of had this religious renaissance, whether it was because of the defeat in 1967 um, with the Arab-Israeli war, or whether it was related to the economic conditions in Tunisia, um, or whether it was related to corruption, um, you know, many types of grievances, um, Anahta started to, you know, put pressure on Bourguiba and then after um, that Ben Ali. Um, and as a result, there had been a number of different crackdowns over time in the 1980s against the top leadership as well as the movement in general. Um, and because of this, you then had some people being in prison, others um, getting exiled, many of them going to London, some going to Paris. Um, but because of this, you also started to see um, uh, new forms of Islamist contestation forming because there is sort of a vacuum. Um, and this really started in the mid-1990s um, when you had one individual, Khatib al-Idrisi, who's a prominent Salafi sheikh coming back from um, studying and teaching in Saudi Arabia for the previous, I think it was like six or seven years, coming back to Tunisia and basing himself in um, Kerwan. Um, and as a result, the regime then, Ben Ali, uh, viewed uh, him as a potential counterweight against Anahta, but also the fact that you know he was seen as apolitical. He was just um, you know proselytizing Islam. People were studying Islam. It was there wasn't necessarily a political nature. So he sort of allowed the growth of um, Salafism to happen. Uh, of course, it was still relatively minor, and even today, uh, Salafism in Tunisia is pretty small. But you got this new pocket of individuals that were exposed to these ideas um, that weren't necessarily um, in the past. Um, additionally, you did see some small levels of activism related to the broader jihadi movement. By that I mean um, individuals that believe in uh, Salafi theology but also um, feel that they, uh, you know, it should not be implemented either through just pure studying or through Tao activities, aka proselytization, missionary activities, or through more um, political activities like sending letters to the leader and giving him an advice, nasiha, um, and actions like that. Instead, it's more, more should be done through violence. Um, and we saw a small movement break away from Nahta in the late 80s called the Tunisian Islamic Front. Um, they're involved in some terrorist attacks in the late 80s and early 1990s. Some of their members then ended up going to Afghanistan and Bosnia, um, but they're relatively snuffed out quickly. Um, and their sort of, um, their heritage now is in more of a mainstream Salafi party in Tunisia, um, Jabhat al-Islah, but all of those guys essentially uh, have since uh, rehabilitated their ideas in, in some sense um, and are no longer interested in it, but they're a lot younger at the time. Um, whereas uh, the only other case really prior to 2011 of jihadi type of 
activism activities was this small cell of individuals of Tunisians who had been uh, operating inside of Europe, inserting themselves back in Tunisia in around 2005, 2006, which was dubbed the Suleiman Group by the government. I mean, they're involved in a low-level insurgency against the government for about three weeks, and they, and they thought that they're going to be able to uh, start something more sustained. Um, and this was also connected to the GSPC, which is now AQIM, um, uh, at the time because they got some training in Algeria ahead of time. And they thought it would be able to really open things up in Tunisia in the way that things had previously been in Algeria. Um, but a, some of their plans had been caught ahead of time, and therefore the military started attacking them, and they weren't necessarily ready. So within three weeks, they're then rolled up. Um, but was but what was interesting. Um, I had the actual I had the opportunity to speak to one of the former um, top ministers in Ben Ali's government at the time, and he was telling me this was in 2012, I think. Um, now he's just he's has nothing to do with government. He's just now. Uh, writes uh, publicly in newspapers, um, uh, how the government really didn't understand the extent to the individuals that sympathized with these ideas at the time. And while they put on a strong face publicly when this happened, they really had no idea where this came from and how it happened. And um, it was sort of, in some ways, uh, I guess you could say a precursor to what we would start to see after 2011 and that people didn't realize that there were people already sympathizing with these ideas, but because the government was so tightly controlling things, it was hard to see it and people were just underground. Um, but the, but the, I would say the, one of the most important things was uh, Tunisians that were in exile in Europe. Um, so if you look at Afghanistan in the 1980s, this is when you, many people view sort of the contemporary onset of this type of broader movement in the Arab world. Um, but the reality is, is not that many Tunisians went. Um, some argue it's because the Tunisian government didn't promote it, like a lot of other Arab governments. Some argue that uh, Nahda was um, in such great competition with the government at the time that it didn't, it didn't, it felt that it was a distraction from what they're doing. Because um, if you remember, in the 1980s, some of the largest um, facilitation and mobilization efforts for Afghanistan. Um, uh, to go and fight the Soviets was done by the International Muslim Brotherhood um, organization. It wasn't like it is now where it, you think about it and you think of Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State or whatever group like that. Um, um, so in some ways, the Tunisians were unique in that respect. Um, uh, and because of that, the Tunisians weren't involved in it really until you started to see the exile of some of individu individuals, whether it was Nahda members that became radicalized because of the crackdown, whether it was the Tunisian Islamic Front guys that decided to take refuge in exile. Um, but really what changed was the conflict in Bosnia in that it was so close to Europe and that it became a huge uh, cause celebre for assisting Muslims that were being slaughtered there. Um, and you started to see the mobilization of people, especially in Britain. Um, and, and some Tunisians started to get linked into these networks. Um, and this was really when you start to see Tunisians getting actively involved in not just um, actions happening locally with Tunisians, but also being connected to those from other Arab countries, um, as well as Western countries for that matter, um, in these broader international jihadist networks um, at the time. And from there, um, sort of the graduates, or I don't know, the, the, the returnees, I guess you could say, of the Bosnian War then started being involved in a lot of the helping out of the GIA in Algeria in the 1990s during the Civil War, whether it was in terms of facilitation of money and weapons, whether it was in terms of media operations. Um, at the time, it was mainly pamphlets and newspapers that were there printing. Um, and then later, it advanced into more terrorist plots um, inside of Europe. And we saw the main ones. Uh, we saw networks in London, uh, Paris, Milan, and Brussels. Um, and uh, this was prior to 9-11 too, where some of these individuals were arrested. Um, and then the culmination in some ways of this organization is that the Tunisians in 1999, in particular Saif Allah bin Hassin, who is better now known as Abu Iyad al-Tunisi, who became, who ended up becoming the leader of Ansar al-Sharia, along with Tariq Marufi, um, they created the Tunisian combatant group where they had part of their operation based in Brussels and the other part based in Afghanistan in the late 1990s and early 2000s. And they were actually the ones 
who did the assassination against Ahmed Shah Massoud two days prior to the 9-11 attacks as a so-called uh, present for Osama bin Laden. Um, so it highlights how Tunisians in many ways have been involved in some key activities related to the broader movement and sort of the history of things that have happened over the years. Um, and then more recently, of course, last decade, Tunisians were one of the larger forces in the Iraq war. Um, of course, the Saudis and Libyans were tops, but you could sort of see the trend that maybe the idea that Tunisians being involved in these types of movements wasn't necessarily awkward, weird, or unique, but it had already developed for about 15 years by the mid-2000s when you started to see them going into Iraq. Um, another uh, important aspect in terms of the conditions that led to the rise or sort of the ability for Ansar al-Sharia to really um, operate in, uh, after 2011 was as a result of the governmental policies. Um, first, you had the transitional government after the fall of Ben Ali um, doing a prisoner amnesty. Of course, many of those who were released were political prisoners prisoners and had every right to be um, released, but there wasn't necessarily any process to look at those who might have been involved in more nefarious type of activities, and they essentially let everybody out of prison without um, checking this. And we saw this process actually um, occur in other countries as well in the Arab world in the post-uprising fervor. You saw it in Libya, you saw it in Egypt, you saw it in Yemen. Um, and in part, that's one of the reasons why some of these movements were able to reactivate after 2011 in a way that you might not have had if they're just starting from scratch. You had these individuals with all these experiences coming out. And in, in a little bit, I'll, I'll get to specifically the relevance of these prisoners. But um, I will say that after Anahta came into power, they sort of had this so-called light touch policy related to Ansar al-Sharia and the Salafis in general, in part because um, their own experience dealing with the regime in the 1980s and the crackdown against them. Um, uh, essentially, they felt that if they were too harsh with them, they would radicalize and that would lead to violence. Um, and they felt that they could potentially co-opt them in buying into the system, the new system in Tunisia. But the reality is, is that if you looked at the rhetoric um, and ideas of Ansar al-Sharia, they weren't interested in becoming part of the democratic process. I mean, they viewed democracy as uh, anathema to Islam in their own opinions. Um, and as a result, because of this, it allowed them to organize and operate um, and recruit um, and, and do the types of missionary activities that they're conducting on the ground in Tunisia, essentially for two years without much harassment at all. Um, and, and then there are also, you know, some innuendo about connections between Anahta and Ansar al-Sharia where there are some leaked tapes that Hanushi, the head of the party, or the head of um, the movement, um, was essentially giving them advice on how to infiltrate the police and military and how they shouldn't get too loud um, with their protesting and their activities, and that they should gradually build things up. So there are all these conspiracies about this. It's, of course, difficult to necessarily know the specifics without, you know, being in these meetings that might have occurred. Um, and then there is also the foreign fighter policy that they had. There is a number of statements from the Tunisian government in 2012 um, and even 2013 about how essentially they couldn't do anything about Tunisians going to Syria. Um, uh, they didn't have the right to it, and they and and that people were going to go, they're going to go, which is interesting because now um, the Tunisian government has a much harder line when you listen to the rhetoric from them. They're even now going so far as opening up relations with the Assad regime because of it to try and track them. Um, but anyways, that's that's another issue. <laughs> um, but the big change really came when um, Ansar al Sharia, as well as some other. Um, individuals and other movements like the League for the Protection of the Revolution and others attacked the U.S. Embassy in Tunis um, on September 11, 2012, which is the same day we also saw the attacks in Benghazi and an, uh, an attempted attack in the U.S. Embassy in Cairo. Um, uh, and because of this, this sort of made Anahta rethink their policies related to what was going on. Um, but while they started to rhetorically change, um, you didn't really see too much in terms of actions. Um, and because of this, after there was the assassination of um, Shukri Belaid in February 2013, um, 
and and then uh, because of this, there's a huge crisis because everybody's like, you can't even protect us anymore. Um, you know, I guess in some ways it's okay. <laughs> You're attacking the Americans is fine, but you know, this is Tunisians now. I um, mean, it became a huge political crisis, um, and they actually abdicated um, their place in power, and that um, it led to then the creation of a new technocratic government government um, in around the spring of 2013. Um, and this is when you start to sort of see the beginning of the end for Ansar al-Sharia in terms of its ability to operate openly um, without harassment. Um, that spring, when they're supposed to have their annual conference in May 2013, it didn't actually go um, according to plan because the Tunisian government essentially said it was illegal. And for the first time in a couple of years, they weren't able to do it. Um, and it was interesting because uh, part of it is, is that the government saw it as a threat to their own power because every year there is an increase in the number of people going. So the first year when they had their forum in May 2011, there was maybe 500 individuals at most that went. But then a year later in May 2012 at their conference, um, there was, I believe, I think it was 12,000 individuals that went. Um, and then when you looked at the one in 2013, there were, they allegedly were claiming that up to 40,000 individuals were planning on going. So you could see how the government was seeing this as a growing issue. Um, but what pretty much ended their ability to operate openly was um, the second assassination of Mohammed Brahmi and then also a large-scale attack in the Shambi Mountains um, in July of 2013, which then led to the designation of the organization by the Tunisian government um, as terrorists in late August 2013. Um, and while they continued to sort of sporadically operate then a little bit here and there um, over the next few months, they more or less were becoming disbanded. Um, and you saw them trying to rebrand in the spring of 2014 under the name Shabab al-Tawheed. Um, but again, that was sort of figured out by the government. And at this current juncture, the organization as it was doesn't exist anymore. Um, and I'll get into later what happened to these individuals that were involved in it. Um, so one of the interesting things about Ansar al-Sharia too is that historically when you think about the jihadist movement is they're only involved in violence. But the reality is that Ansar al-Sharia was um, pr starting sort of this Dawa first program or strategy in some respects. Um, they felt that the conditions within Tunisia were ripe for Dawa and that there was no point in having any violent actions because the society had opened up so much and they essentially had the ability to proselytize openly without harassment. Um, and, and a lot of this came from some influential writings that happened previously. There have historically been a bunch of debates within um, the ideology, but uh, sort of the main one was uh, related to this was sort of the management of savagery versus the jihad al tamkin um, ideas. I'm sure some of you might have recently heard about management of savagery in relation to the Islamic State and their activities. Um, but Abu Muhammad al-Maktisi wrote this um, one book about the called Stances on the Fruits of Jihad about how there are issues um, within the movement over the years. He wrote this in 2005 in response to Abu Musab al-Zarqawi and what he was doing inside of Iraq, essentially saying that the movement had essentially become a movement that was fighting just for the sake of fighting. They weren't fighting for the sake of sort of consolidating an Islamic state or consolidating um, gains on the ground and that because of it, it was just going to eventually lead to more and more violence over time. Um, so he came up with this whole idea about jihad al tamkin and how it was important to consolidate control of the gains that one made while they're involved in uh, fighting. Um, and part of this uh, was uh, having to do with uh, dawah activities, um, essentially proselytization, calling people back to the true interpretations of Islam, at least their interpretations, um, and proselytization. Um, and as a result, because of this new environment in Tunisia, um, as, well as, as well as in Libya and Egypt, we saw this after 2011, that the organizations uh, were primarily focused on a Dawa first strategy. Um, that's not to say that they weren't um, thinking about how they might be involved in violence in the future, but they thought that they should secure any potential gains while the conditions were ripe for it um, at this uh, potential time frame. Um, and, and this was uh, then pushed forward also by Al-Qaeda at the time. Um, when talking about the different countries that had gone through these uprisings. And then there's also Abu Ayyad al-Tanizi's experience inside of London 
in the 1990s, he was one of those who had been exiled. Um, and he, was, he had been a student of Abu Qatad al Filistini, who's considered one of the most important jihadi theorists over the last 20, 25 years. Um, and also, London was sort of uh, a laboratory in some ways in being able to, within the confines of a democracy, to proselytize these ideas um, because of you know, freedom of speech in the context of the West. Um, so he was able to see how this was successful in terms of getting people to join up with the movement and thought that he would be able to implement it in the Tunisian context now that society had been opened up. Um, so while their public presence wasn't um, open until around March, April, May 2011, the idea behind the organization, the program that they hoped to achieve, actually started in prison in 2006, and they established an actual plan or an action plan for what they would uh, do after they would come out of prison. Part of this was as a result of, at the time in 2006, when Hamadi Jabali, who was the leader of Anahta inside of Tunisia at the time, um, was released from prison in amnesty um, by the Ben Ali regime. As a result, many of those imprisoned, including Abu Ayyad um, and others, were like, well, maybe we will become, uh, will be coming out of prison soon as well, and we should try and prepare for what would happen, and therefore be able to push forward our, our particular agenda. Um, so they essentially, obviously it didn't happen until five years later, but they essentially were able to come up with a plan for what they're gonna do and hit the ground running. Um, and as I alluded to earlier, many of these Tunisians that had been in prison, because some of them tried going back to Tunisia after the Afghan war, the Iraq war, um, or had been deported from uh, Europe and then rearrested once they went into Tunisia, um, had all these experiences in the 1990s um, up until the 9-11 attacks. So it wasn't just individuals starting from scratch. Um, and then the rest is history in terms of them being released from prison and being able to start really organizing on the ground inside of Tunisia. Um, and this is actually a picture in Tunis of the first um, conference that they held in, in mid-May 2011. Um, as you can see, it's real, fairly uh, well attended. Obviously, it's not huge, but you could see that even when they're having their first conference ever, they're able to already have some level of support within society. Um, and, and this is now almost four years ago. Um, so what's, what's relevant about AST and how they operated? Um, they have an interesting organizational structure. Um, it's not sort of fully centralized in a classical bureaucratic or Western type of organization. There's more this top level national leadership that has strategic directives and ideas of what should be done um, and many of them are based in Tunis or Sousse. Um, but then they delegate sort of the tactics or the operations in how they uh, hope to carry out these types of activities more on the regional and local level so that it doesn't seem like somebody that's an outsider is trying to push ideas on them. They really wanted to get those from particular villages and cities outside of the coastal areas um, when they're proselytizing in more of the interior to be a familial face in many respects. So they had sort of this two-tiered system of uh, leadership and how they structured the organization so that um, those that were working on the leadership level locally or regionally had ties to the national leaders, but they also had the autonomy based off of their own experience living there and the people that they knew how to implement the particular um, strategies that were being given. Um, so they decided to do a bunch of different types of activities um, over time, and I list a number of them out. You know, they went to different souks or markets every week, and they'd essentially pass out pamphlets with their ideas. Um, sometimes they'd go to the markets and give people, you know, lemonade or orange juice or mango juice or whatever juice, um, and pass out their pamphlets as well. Um, they would hold these different lectures about, related to Islam, um, they'd have these caravans where they'd have people driving from other parts of the country with a lot of food that they were able to get um, from donations or money from wealthy businessmen um, that were helping um, essentially um, provide these resources to them. And they'd drive to these more 
poorer areas of the country and provide aid to them. Um, so they're essentially filling a vacuum um, that the government wasn't doing because even though there was the transition, the government was still being seen as ineffective in, in the non-coastal parts of the country in many respects. Um, and they're essentially competing with the government in many regards in this way. Um, and similarly, they start to set up medical services. They did these community forums where they're talking about who they were, what they wanted to do, the ideas of the organization, and how one could get involved. Um, they're involved in repairing people's houses and buildings. Um, uh, and then holiday assistance is essentially providing slaughtered um, animals to those during, you know, Eid al-Fitr or Eid al-Awda. Um, uh, so that those who are poor and needy were able to fulfill um, their religious uh, duties, essentially. Um, and the thing about these Dawah activities is that it was a means for them to spread their ideology. But what was interesting is that you would see a difference in how they would promote themselves locally in the types of pamphlets they'd pass out versus how they're um, sort of broadcasting themselves to more of a global audience when they're posting content online. For sure, they're posting their local content online as well, um, but the local content was more sort of your garden variety, religious and Salafi type of ideas about, you know, ethics in Islam, um, you know, how to pray. Because a lot of what the movement was was about returning people who didn't really know the basics of Islam because of the history of secularism in the country for the previous um, 50 or 60 years, returning to Islam in many respects, so they're trying to bring back the basics, and they had a lot of these basic types of pamphlets, um, whereas if you went on their Facebook page or on their Twitter account, um, you know, they would be putting up content from Abu Muhammad al-Maktisi, who's like the most important jihadi strategist and theorist, uh, Said Qutub, who's sort of the godfather of the, um, you know, jihadi movement now, um, who died in 1966. Um, you had stuff that they'd post from AQIM or Ayman al-Zawahiri. Um, so you could see that there was a dichotomy in how they're promoting themselves, whether it was to more of a global audience to those in the broader jihadi milieu um, in other countries um, versus those locally. And the thing is, is that once people became enmeshed in the movement, and it wasn't just reaching out and trying to get people involved in it, that's when they started to lay down on the more of the you know radical ideas. They didn't promote those radical ideas at first. And one of the interesting things too is I actually had the opportunity to meet with a bunch of different members in a few different cities um, over a couple of trips in 2012 and 2013, is that a lot of the times uh, these Tao activities were a, a means for people to get to know them. Uh, you know, there was this one slogan that they always used was, um, hear from us, not about us, because when people actually interacted with them on a face-to-face -face basis, they realized that they weren't these monsters that the media was necessarily making out to them to be. They're just regular humans doing proselytization efforts. Um, even if, you know, I or others might disagree with it, they weren't, you know, really vile individuals necessarily, at least in terms of how they're um, operating publicly, so that when people approached them, they realized that maybe they were genuine Muslims and just trying to, you know, push forward um, their religion and things like that. Um, so that really was sucked people in as well. Um, and it also provided an identity and activities and opportunities for many youth who really didn't have anything else going on in their lives um, as well. So just to give a little basic overview of where they're doing these activities, um, uh, it's hard to tell every single one since some of them overlap on the same things, but it just basically shows how they had a relatively robust national effort in terms of being in most areas of the country, most of the key cities, and even in some of the more rural areas or different parts of the country as well. Um, and this was uh, this is just a list from uh, their first activities until I think February 2013. I didn't, I haven't, up, I still need to update it for my PhD, which I will get to soon, I promise. Um, but it will end up going through August 2013 once I finish the database because over the last, uh, since I started following it in May 2011, have essentially saved every single thing that they've posted online, even though it's not online anymore because their accounts have been taken down. But I have 16,000 files from them over like a two and a half year period. It's crazy. Um, whether it's uh, Facebook posts, videos, um, audio messages, 
PDF files, pictures. I got a lot of pictures, a lot of pictures. Um, and just give an example, you know, on the upper left corner is sort of a graphic that they'd put online um, showing uh, an event that they would do, and then under it is the specific um, action that they would do for this event. And the one on the left is actually the first um, one that they published online for the DAO activities they did. And then the, the picture on the right is them passing out medicine for those who need it. Um, and this is actually one of the last DAO events they did before being designated as a uh, terrorist group by the Tunisian government to sort of, sort of show how there is continuity in these efforts over, those, over the years. Um, so now getting into the more um, violent aspects of it, I guess one can say, um, because that's where things have turned in some respects. Um, so his activities, essentially um, this, you know, you could describe as vigilante activities in sort of English, but it comes from this idea of, um, you know, enjoining good and forbidding wrong, um, and it's part of this whole theory within Islam. Um, and while Ansar al-Sharia didn't um, tell people to do this, they sort of looked the other way when their own members were involved in this, and you saw intimidation, you saw them attacking people that were drinking in bars, you saw them attacking people in brothels. Um, there are some instances where people were actually beat up and killed. Um, uh, you know, they're doing stuff against people who are eating or drinking during Ramadan. Um, uh, and actions like this. Um, and over time, it got larger and larger of an issue. Um, and because of this, in addition to the assassinations um, and other issues, um, this just led to the government deciding that this is enough. We really need to regulate and control what's going on here because this is getting, this is getting out of hand. Another thing that was going on in the background, too, while it wasn't necessarily um, exposed to by the local members of the organization was that there were still many connections between Abu Ayyad and the senior leadership with key international jihadi figures, whether it was with somebody like Hani al-Sabai, who used to be an Egyptian Islamic Jihad, um, and he was his group there involved in the assassination of Sadat in the early 80s, um, whether it was with Turkey al-Bin Ali, he's a Bahraini ideologue who now is a member of the Islamic State and a preacher for them inside of Iraq and Syria. Um, <clears throat> whether it's Abu Qatar al-Filistini, who had been Abu Ayyad's mentor, um, and others, um, they were providing messages for them. They were, some of them actually came to Tunisia and gave uh, guest khutbahs at sermons on Fridays um, in some occasions. Or some of them actually created videos specifically for their yearly or annual um, conference um, in commemoration of it. Um, so while those on the local level might not necessarily have been exposed to it, there are still these connective tissues between the organization itself and these more radical activities happening outside of Tunisia. Um, they are more connected to violence. Um, then there was sort of the beginning of what became more of actual jihad, jihad first approach versus a dawah first approach um, with the Essentially, it is an AQIM cutout, a Tunisian version, um, called Katibat Uqba Ibn Nafi. Um, and really, at least I recall first hearing about them in December 2012, when there were some attacks on the Algerian border, um, and the Algerian press started talking about them, and then they more and more came in, uh, involved in attacks in the uh, Shambi Mountain region, which is right near uh, Kasserine, as well as right along the uh, border with Algeria. And there have been <clears throat> a number of attacks over the last few years, but it really hasn't um, gone beyond these mountainous regions. Um, the attacks have only really happened in the surrounding area around it. Um, and then you also start to see individuals training and fighting abroad. Um, so because of this Dawa first approach, there are, of course, individuals that were not necessarily interested in just doing Dawa. They were impatient, they were hotheads, or they thought that this was too soft, essentially. Um, and as a result, AST um, essentially became a key facilitator and recruiter to people who wanted to be involved so that the violence wouldn't occur in Tunisia but would happen outside. But of course you know that people would eventually come home and um, uh, this could change the game for them in some respects. But you had people training in Algeria, you had people training in Mali, in Libya. Um, then you also saw foreign fighting in Libya, Mali, and Syria as well. 
Um, and as a result, because there is a larger pool of individuals now involved in Ansar al-Sharia, because of these proselytization efforts, um, it is easier to recruit individuals to potentially go abroad and fight then. And that's in some ways one of the reasons why there's so many Tunisians that have um, gone abroad because they were exposed to Ansar al-Sharia and then the networks um, that Ansar al-Sharia was connected to based off of their past experiences in Europe in the 90s as well as the individuals that they um, knew over the years um, allow them to connect them to say originally Jabhat al-Nusra in Syria but then later the Islamic State um, and now you see individuals um, you know involved in fighting also in Libya next door. Um, so Ansar al-Sharia is designated in August 2013. It was actually funny. I was I was on the plane from Paris to Tunis when they announced it officially. So when I got there, it was just crazy because I was planning on meeting some of these guys. I was talking to some other people that knew about it. So it was, it was an interesting time to be in the country right when it happened and to sort of also talk to people in the government about how they thought this was going to go down in the approach. Um, but since then, um, the organization is more or less defunct. Um, individuals either after this designation decided to sort of quit these types of activities. Um, some of them felt that they were betrayed. They didn't realize that some of these more nefarious connections or um, act, uh, violence was going on related to the organization. I spoke to some individuals who were really only attracted and interested in it because of the missionary types of activities and were not interested in getting involved in violence. Um, so they just quit or they went back to sort of more of the apolitical or uh, types of Salafi um, approaches. Then many individuals had been arrested, um, but you also saw individuals going on to Syria, um, some going to Libya, and even some joining up with uh, Katibat Upa ibn Nafi um, in the Shambi Mountains. But most of them, I, I believe, um, were either arrested or went to Syria. Um, and one of the things that we've uh, seen more recently um, is that while Upa ibn Nafi has gotten a lot of the press about being the main terrorist group um, inside of Tunisia, um, we obviously saw the terrorist attack at Bardo in Tunisia uh, a few weeks ago or a month ago now, something like that. I don't remember the specific date. Um, but based off of the research that I've been looking at and conducting, um, they are trying to penetrate the country more and more um, from Libya since there are um, up to a thousand Tunisians in Libya training and fighting and doing whatever. Um, so I personally think that at some point in the near to medium term, I wouldn't be surprised if the Islamic State tried to announce another, you know, wilaya or province, um, and this one being called Wilayat Ifriqiya, which is just a classical name for um, Tunisia in that area of uh, the world. Um, but, you know, we'll see what happens. It, it sort of follows some of the priming that I've seen in other cases where they've tried to build up capacities, whether it's related to um, uh, Nigeria or Sinai or Yemen or things like that. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if that's happening. Um, but, you know, all this stuff post-August 2000, 2013 is not really in my dissertation um, just because I was more interested in why things got so big so quickly, why they became so much of a force and why they became so relevant. Um, but because of this, um, you know, now there is, you know, similar to other countries, a large amount of Tunisians that have been exposed to these ideas, these ideologies, these methodologies, um, and been radicalized by it in some respects, not necessarily in the Tunisian context, but for sure in the Syrian context where things are just so horrible that you know anybody that's in Syria sees the kind of um, massacres that have occurred would easily get radicalized too, I would think. Um, but because of this, this uh, creates a lot of problems within Tunisia, I think, um, in terms of how to deal with these individuals if and when they do come home, since you know there are reports that up to, I think, 3,000 Tunisians that have been in Syria and you know, at least 500 to 1,000 that have been in Libya um, and then however many are actually inside of Tunisia now. Um, it's a problem, and as we've seen historically in other countries, um, this problem doesn't necessarily go away, even if there might be lulls in it over time. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we started to see more um, activities happening, and 
unlike with Ansar al Sharia, you know, even though I obviously disagree with um, their ideology, at least they're doing it in a nonviolent fashion. Whereas I suspect if if there is an actual campaign in Tunisia by the Islamic State, we'll see some similar things there that we have seen, unfortunately, in other places, whether it's Syria, Iraq, Libya, um, you know, now small cases in Sinai and Yemen. Um, but I hope not because uh, I love Tunisia. But unfortunately, that's at least where things are heading based off of what I'm seeing. So I'll just leave it at there, and I look forward to your questions. So thanks for coming out. For sure. Um, so regarding the first in Nahta, um, I would say if you're talking about the movement now in 2015, I think that it's just they're in two different worlds. Maybe if you're looking at it at the height of some of the radicalization and violence in the 80s, there might be some comparisons. But if you're looking at the two of them now, I just think that it's just totally different what's going on in some respects. Um, uh, especially in terms of the, of the evolution of it in many ways. I mean, it really um, is, uh, you know, I wouldn't say innovative, but they've, they've really um, changed the game in some ways in terms of being able to sort of balance their Islamism but also being pragmatic with other secular actors in the country um, in a way we haven't really seen in other contexts. Um, even, you know, people talk about Turkey, but um, the AKP have dominated the government over the last 10 or 12 years. They didn't really have the same kind of balancing that you have seen in Tunisia with the secular parties being strong enough to potentially check against any um, excesses um, that we've increasingly seen more in Turkey over the last five years, I guess you could say. Um, and regarding the second one, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to say. Uh, I can for sure say that the statement claiming responsibility came from uh, the Islamic State's key disseminators online when it came out, the ones that are pushing out the media content always. Um, and they're, and that, then the media, the efforts of the Islamic State is fully centralized, so they have complete command and control over it, whether it's in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Libya, Sinai, Northern Nigeria, AFPAC. Um, it's all controlled by the top leadership or the top people in their media committee, or however they describe it. Um, uh, so I could for sure say that that they definitely um, knew about what was going on. Whether Abu Bakr al Baghdadi is like, you should totally attack Tunisia in this particular spot in this particular day. I'm more skeptical of that. I'm, I'm unsure that there's that type of day to day um, micromanaging. I think um, it's more that Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and the Majlis al-Shura essentially have these strategic ideas and directives of what should be happening in the different provinces that they control and run. And then from there, the local emir um, and local Sharia official and local military commander, then based off of the local conditions in the areas that those people know, since they're usually from those areas, um, though there are some that might not be, but they surround themselves with locals. 
can institute the tactics and operations necessary based off of it. Um, and I and I would I would guess then that those that are operating inside of Libya were the ones who might have been involved in coming up with this idea. Not necessarily those in Iraq and Syria, but the but that's you know one of the things when you study these types of groups is that they're clandestine in many ways. So there are certain things you just don't know, and you got to be sort of humble about it. Uh, and um, you know, as as one of my uh, old friends jokes. The only experts of these types of groups are the members of the groups. We're just specialists trying to um, follow and understand them. So there are unfortunately gaps in what we know in comparison to say more mainstream types of um, social movements. Um, so in some ways I don't know, but at least that's my best educated guess from what I know of these groups. I mean, there have been, you know, if you look at Islamism in general, there are a bunch of different groups that have done social services and dawah type of activities over the last, I guess, you know, 70 or 80 years. You could potentially point to the collapse of the Ottoman Empire is when you really start to see these types of activities in different parts of the Muslim world. Um, I mean, part of it is just the differences in ideologies in some ways. You know, a Nahda is more from the Ikhwani trend historically, even though you know, compared to the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, they've always been a bit more pragmatic or uh, open in some ways. Um, um, whereas AST is more looking at things from, uh, you know, a Salafi perspective. Um, so, I mean, that I think that would be one of the main differences in some respects. Um, but, you know, I haven't studied Nahda too closely. I only know, like, the history of the organization, I don't know necessarily particulars, so I can't say specifically just because I haven't looked at them as much. Um, but that would be the thing that would jump off uh, the top of my head. Um, in terms of AST and Nahta post-2011, I would say that um, at first AST really wasn't trying to bug a Nahta because it seemed like they're letting them operate and do whatever. Um, but as, as you point out, after the embassy attack and then after more and more actions and the government be seeming to have different types of rhetoric um, and arresting more people, that there is more confrontationist type of rhetoric against them by Abu Ayyad, by other leaders of the organization um, over time, whether it was fall 2012 all the way up until late summer 2013. So you did see a shift over time. It was actually interesting because there was... Um, an argument between Abu Ayyad um, and then this other guy named Abu Ayyub. <laughs> Easy to get confused. <laughs> they sound similar, but um, 
uh, in 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 around two thousand in late two thousand eleven, early two thousand twelve, Abu Ayyub was one of the original founding members of the group, but he thought that AST was being too soft against Nahda, um, or that um, you know they weren't being uh, so in people's faces, and that they're essentially um, you know almost compensating in some ways. Um, compared to what we have historically seen from groups that have been involved in sort of the jihadi milieu, and we then saw Abu Ayyub break from AST and sort of do his own things on the side, it never really caught steam, but then he went over to Syria and joined up with ISIS, so um, it looks like maybe he had the last laugh, I don't know. But, uh, so that's interesting too in terms of the debates about how to deal with Nahda, as well as the particular um, strategy that they wanted to implement after the revolution in 2011. I have a quick question. Um, yeah, sure. How, first of all, are you, um, what, pretty unique in this type, in the, this research that you're doing, and is it, has it been very difficult? I, mean, I find it really surprising that, that you've been able to go back and forth, talk to these people. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, in some ways I'm very lucky that I chanced upon it in some ways at that particular time period where it was sort of like this two and a half year period where you had the opportunity to talk to these guys and it was safe and you didn't really fear it because they're essentially in, interested in being proselytizers and missionaries. They weren't interested in doing something politically through violence. So you felt relatively safe. Uh, you know, I wouldn't suggest anybody try and talk to somebody with that's a Tunisian jihadist today. I, I really wouldn't because I wouldn't know what would happen because most of those involved in it now inside of Tunisia are only involved in uh, violence or training for violence. Yeah, so I mean, it, in some ways it's just pure luck that uh, I started doing this research at that particular time period, was able to go to Tunisia at that particular time and get contacted with some of uh, some members in the organization in um, a few different cities. Um, uh, and I felt, I felt safe and fine when I was there, um, when I went and when I talked to these individuals. They're actually really nice people to me. <laughs> they actually brought me like sweets from Kerouan and were, you know, providing me like couscous meals. They're also partly doing because I think they wanted me to convert to Islam, but that's a whole other issue. They're doing the Dawah on me too. But, um, uh, but yeah, I, I honestly think it was just a unique time. And the thing too is that um, this is unique to Tunisia as well. I mean, um, you can't do this anywhere else. Historically related to this movement or even in other countries where there are the uprising um, because those in, say, Libya were still involved in fighting, and of course there are always issues of potentially getting kidnapped. Um, and then in Egypt, uh, you know, the Egyptian jihadis are notorious for being extreme, um, so most people usually shy away from trying to talk to them, even if they're more out in the open. Um, maybe if you were a researcher from the Arab world, it would be different, but a Westerner, you know, I. I would think it would be more difficult. So I honestly think that it was just extremely unique, um, and those who had the opportunity to do it are extremely lucky, and I'm unsure that there will necessarily be a time that this will replicate itself, at least in the near future. So um, I'm lucky that I had the opportunity to actually speak to them as well as follow what they're posting online and sort of combine that and triangulate in some ways to see how things matched up or how things were different. Um, uh, I would I would have liked to have done more interviews with individuals, um, uh, but then the designation happened and that really changed things. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to get more interviews that I would have liked to to get some more information. But so that's the reality too. Is I got some, but not everything. Whereas other researchers, I think, had more access who might have actually been living there. I I wasn't living in Tunisia. I was just going in for different trips that were. 10 to 14 days at a time, usually um, every few months or so. Um, but, you know, I think uh, for what I was able to do, I've gotten some solid research, at least I hope. <laughs> so. Mm-hmm. 
mm -hmm. people in the streets and yeah. when people knew what your research was about and can understand it well maybe it wasn't so clear from the very beginning that it was about jihadists right? so Yeah, I mean, it 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 seemed like when you talk to people in government, they didn't really they weren't really interested in being open about it, or they might just not have really known what was going on. To be honest with you, they just seemed like they really had a general understanding of the group or organization. Um, when I talk to activists, they usually looked at it more in an ideological sense. These are like youth activists, leftists, people like that. So they didn't really have analysis that you take at face value because of what they would hear in their own you know media outlets uh, you know sky is falling type stuff um, it's still interesting to get that perspective just to see how the debate was being held and sort of how the debate is on two different planes in some respects um, but I pretty much can was able to talk about most topics with the members of Ansar al Sharia um, the only ones that they sort of got a little tense about was when I asked them more about like AQIM and Al-Qaeda and what was going on there. That's when they started to get a little squeamish in some respects. But beyond that, I was able to talk about um, them with other anything pretty much. Um, and the thing is, I was mostly interested in the, the types of missionary, dawah, social service type of activities anyway. So they were happy and uh, free with spilling information about that since they were proud of it and excited and they um, really were interested in getting that information out there. So um, that wasn't so much of an issue. Um, but it, it would have been nice to have done more interviews with more people in other parts of the country to maybe compare how it was done in different parts of the country um, or get more of a picture about what sort of the routine of a daily life was. I, I really only scratched the surface in some ways, um, which is unfortunate, but it is what it is. Yeah. So, in terms of the Islamic State, we've heard a lot about women in the Islamic State. Women have, mm -hmm. um, you know, posted. Women in the Islamic State have published information, we've encouraged other women to mm -hmm. emigrate, and etc. And I'm interested in, um, you know, what you know about women members of <laughs> social media. Did they appear in any of the online uh, photos? Yeah. Yeah, there, uh, at least publicly, there really wasn't that much. It was more like your classical type of organization in some respects, where it was mainly just men as the face of it. Um, they did some activities in particular, but it was very small, at least in terms of what they publicized. I imagine there might have been more happening on the ground that they might have not shown. Um, but what the Islamic State has been doing with these women recruits and women foreign fighters, there's unfortunately not a better term for it since I don't think anybody's come up with it. Um, since they're not actually fighting, they're mainly involved in, you know, what someone might term, you know, traditional women's roles historically, I guess, um, even though that sounds terrible too. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's very new in many ways what the Islamic State is doing. It, we have, really haven't seen these jihadi groups using women like this, whether it's in propaganda, whether it's in recruitment, or whether it's in helping out in day-to-day -day activities. Because um, besides, you know, rearing the children, you know, cooking, cleaning, uh, educating, nursing, um, they're also involved in some of the security stuff too. Um, they're not fighting, but they help out at checkpoints, um, uh, you know, patting women down because they're all wearing the niqab. Um, so they have roles like that too. Um, and they're also involved in the, um, the Hizba activities of the Islamic State for women that don't wear the right clothes or not, you know, going to prayers on time or whatever else violations they've instituted based off of their interpretations of Islam. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's different. Um, and I'm unsure we've seen anything like this before um, with, you know, any of these types of groups, whether it's Ansar al-Sharia, whether it's Al-Qaeda or their different branches or any other more localized groups that we saw more in the 80s and 90s. Um, the Islamic State has been very innovative, um, unfortunately in a bad way, uh, in a ne or a negative way, um, but 
That's the reality. You said you had lots of pictures. You want to show us? <laughs> Um, it's on my external hard drive, um, so if I, if I have time, I could show it, but it's not on my laptop right now. <laughs> How many external hard drives do you have? <laughs> um, I just use one, but it's two terabytes, so it's, it's quite large, and it's got, it's got content not just from Ansar al-Sharia, but from pretty much all groups. <laughs> so. I have no idea. I couldn't tell you, but uh, I'm sure they'd probably want to see it. I'm sure a lot of people would probably want to see a lot of the documents I have on my external hard drive um, since I save everything because I know that a lot of it gets taken down quickly um, since uh, on social media, you know, if it's gone, it's gone. It's not like, you know, a classic website where archive.org would suck it up and then you could go back anytime and check it out. Um, which is nice because then you could go back to some of the old jihadi websites from like the 90s and early 2000s. But if you want to do research on this content now, you literally have to save it right away. Otherwise, it's you're probably going to lose it. Um, so, you know, you have to create your own sort of methodologies for this, which goes into, you know, research ethics and all these other issues too. Um, but I mean, that's for another discussion. <laughs> There's actually a new academic article, I forgot by who, and I don't remember the title, but I saw it just came out in a journal um, a few weeks ago about how a lot of individuals in Tunisia, even though overtly and publicly they weren't showing religiosity at, back at home, they're still, you know, doing a lot of the types of rituals and traditions uh, after all the different reforms that Bourguiba put in place. Um, though I will say that, you know, at least with Ansar al-Sharia or groups like this, they're still extremely fringe within society. Um, obviously, it gets a lot more attention because it scares us in some ways, or it scares people on the ground. Um, so, of course, it's going to get more attention in outsized media. But, you know, if, if you look at the reactions to the embassy attacks or the assassinations against um, the two uh, politicians, and then you sort of saw the election results. Um, I think that actually, in many ways, some of these reforms, education, cultural, have remained in Tunisia in many respects. You know, a lot of the ideas being put forth in the last election, at least by Nida Tunis and some of the other more secular parties, was about returning to sort of Bourguiba's style of um, reform. Um, in society, they obviously weren't talking about Ben Ali since many of them said that he sort of, you know, broke from the true true ideas of Borgibism, and if, if one wants to call it that. So I do think that his legacy is still very strong and still permeates society strongly. It's just that people are more exposed to these more fringe, radical ideas and ideologies than in the past. Um, uh, and that there still was, you know, people being religious in society. Um, but it was obviously tapered over because the government was authoritarian. I mean, it is a reality. So, um, 